Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Tamara Luce. I'm the director of the Southeast Asia program. And we are going to try to start pretty much right on time. Before I introduce the speaker, please let me say a few words about Frank Gole, after whom this lecture series is named. Gole is a Filipinist, or was a Filipinist. He joined Cornell in the 1950s uh, and taught economics here. We're grateful to his wife, Clara, who unfortunately recently passed away, because she, along with many others, some of whom I think are in this room, helped establish the Gole Endowment that supports this lecture series. It's my genuine honor to introduce to you our speaker, giving the ninth Gole Memorial Lecture, Professor Benedict Anderson. He's the Professor Emeritus of Government and Southeast Asian Studies at Cornell. Many of you probably know this already. Professor Anderson was born in Kunming, China to an English mother and an Anglo-Irish father who served in China's maritime customs service from just about the beginning of uh, World War I to the beginning of World War II. From China, the, fa the family moved to various places, uh, including, and not in this order, London, Waterford, Ireland, Colorado, and California. Now, as an aside, those of us who've had the benefit of studying with Professor Anderson have witnessed SoCal's sartorial influence on him. The ubiquitous uh, poncho, I don't know if you will remember that, which he often wore to class. Uh, and just a week ago at a conference on Thailand, he, supported, uh, he sported surfer shorts and sandals. It was very chic. As a young man, Professor Anderson graduated from Cambridge in classics and winded up almost by chance at Cornell in 1958. He came here to study government uh, with Professor George Cahan, and he also said he came here, and this is a quote from an article he'd written, uh, for no better reason than that Indonesia was in the news. So, uh, and he talks a little bit about the chance and chances that play a role in uh, the choices we make he conducted fieldwork in Indonesia, which was politically explosive in the 1960s, yet also a place he found infinitely rich to experience in full, not just in terms of the politics, but perhaps more importantly in terms of the language and culture that imbued his days and nights on Java. Professor Anderson's dissertation research on the 1945 Indonesian Revolution resulted in his acclaimed book, Java in a Time of Revolution. His work with Ruth McVeigh on the 1965 coup that led to the massive purge of Indonesian communists became known as the Cornell Paper and led eventually to his being banned from Indonesia for 26 years. His scholarship on Indonesia continued despite the ban and it led him to adopt an even wider comparative perspective with significant research on Thailand and the Philippines, learning Thai and Tagalog and Spanish along the way. Anderson, Professor Anderson is most widely known for his 1983 masterpiece, Imagine Communities, Reflections on the Origins and Spread of Nationalism. Uh, the last I checked, this was translated into about 30 languages. He's also published widely, and I stopped counting after 350, uh, on literature, he's produced translations, uh, congressional and UN testimonies, film studies, sexuality studies, uh, and recently on Buddhist hell. As if this was not impressive enough, he began the now award-winning journal Indonesia while he was still a graduate student at Cornell in 1966. Uh, he served as editor for 18 years, which uh, is a labor of love. In the first issue of the journal, his editorial note highlighted a few themes that characterize his scholarly approach more generally. He aimed to create a fiercely interdisciplinary field of Indonesian studies. So culture, literature, language, the arts, now film, were seen as essential as a window onto understanding a place, including that place's politics, economics, and history. His work has long been recognized as stellar in this regard. If his honors and awards are any, any indication, I did not list them all. Uh, just listed a few here. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Philosophical Society. Uh, 
He was awarded, among many other things, the Fukuoka Prize in 2000 for Outstanding Scholarship on Asia. And most recently, he was awarded the Hirschman Prize in 2011 by the Social Science Research Council. On a more personal note, as a former student of Professor Anderson's, I can honestly say that he was intimidating, even in the poncho, and I never worked harder to please. I don't think any of us did, but it made all of us better scholars. In the classroom, I remember his twist on the Socratic method. We had just read, and actually, John Tuck and I just assigned parts of this book, William Skinner's grueling 300 plus page on the Chinese uh, page book on the Chinese in Thailand, and this is a mammoth encyclopedic text. He stood before us at the beginning of class, and he asked the simple question, what's missing? We shrank. <laughs> nothing. I mean, Skinner Siv is so tightly woven, there was nothing he didn't include in that book. Uh, there was about an hour of silence, and I think he took a nap, I'm not sure. <clears throat> no one raised their hand. The point is, the idea of absences, searching for them, is a theme in all of his courses and maybe the inspiration for his best works. In a world overflowing, brimming to the gills with data, when we struggle to discern the useful from the useless, Professor Anderson's lesson to look for absences is apropos. And with that, I would like to introduce Professor Benedict O'Gorman Anderson, who will talk to us about letters, secrecy, and the information age, the trajectory of historiography in Southeast Asia. Well, thank you all. Is this, uh, am I audible in the back or not? It's okay? Anybody who says no should say no, 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 loudly. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, my art director uh, for an embarrassingly long uh, introduction. And at least she put in a lot of teases and jokes uh, which makes me feel much better. And she explained the Yole lecture and its origins. Uh, and I'm very proud to be uh, the ninth uh, uh, person who will give this talk. I have to warn you that this is rather an eccentric and experimental talk. And the reason is this, that as the Gole's, uh, the Gole uh, lecture series uh, has been intended to do two things, or actually only one thing, which is to find a way to reach over the typical campus walls of each discipline, of each area of studies, uh, and many other things. So what I'm going to try to do is to uh, speak to you in some way which is open to is it, try to make an opening uh, with the larger campus community. This isn't an easy task, but I decided to uh, write or speak about the life and death of archives. Um, that is covered by, in some way, by letters, secrecy, and uh, the information age. Okay, too, too loud? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this, I should say, frankly, in honor of the, what I regard as the most important institutional network in, at Cornell, and that its network of fantastic libraries and all the people who are, are responsible for keeping those libraries as fantastic as they really are. We can't live without libraries, uh, and we have a terrific one here. So this is a thank you letter to um, libraries, and especially ours. This uh, talk is uh, broken into five rel related, but uh, probably you will find rather eccentric sections 
The first section I call the specter of the state without archives. And let me uh, spend about five minutes on this. The great Somali novelist, Nuruddin Farah, during the 1970s, when he'd already gone into almost permanent exile from his home country, he wrote this uh, three, three novels as part of a trilogy, which he called the variations on the theme of an African dictatorship. It's a portrait of his country's terrifying experiences during the first decade of General Siad Bares' ruthless autocracy, which began with a coup in 1969 and ended in a civil war in 1991, from which Somalia is still, in many ways, still suffering, which is 20 years later. The reader learns that, or learns, at least is told, that the regime actually puts nothing on paper and all orders, threats, decisions, and dreams are conveyed by unidentified whispering voices on unplaceable telephones. Written communications from the citizenry are never answered. In this way, the Somali state, which is disintegrating actually, was described as a state without archives. And under this dictatorship, by the mouth and by the ear, not the eye, information, such as it is, consists of rumors, mostly, it turns out, initiated by the dictatorship itself. Middle-class opponents of the regime are scared enough to destroy their personal and family archives. If they're interrogated in safe houses, neither questions nor answers are recorded. There are no meaningful courts. This is not an exact picture at all of the uh, regime, but it's a kind of uh, gr grotesque or scary uh, caricature or allegory of the regime. And you can see that the novelist in exile is thinking of himself as you can imagine somebody like Borges or uh, as the archivist without archives, as well as Walter Benjamin's fabled storyteller. The foreign reader will find that the allegorical novel's mix of magical and social realism is quite riveting. You can't put the books down. But he or she needs to be reminded that the Som Somalis had never had a state of their own, had never had monarchies, and they fell into British and Italian imperial hands, British in the north, Italians in the south, in the late 19th century. And this lasted until uh, in the middle of World War II, when the fascist regime in Italy collapsed, and the British were asked by the, what was left of the League of Nations to take a mandate to put the two colonies together and prepare for independence around 1960. This new independent state, which barely exists now, was extremely poor, and the literacy rate was extremely low too. A standard Somali writing system didn't exist until the early 1970s, in the early days of the, uh, of the dictatorship. And it's interesting that the autocrat himself actually created a large number of uh, primary schools and secondary schools, which were all obliged to use text in the printed Somali language. This program obviously had its positive sides, but as in many other post-World War II new states, behind it there lay a hidden agenda for the long run. <laughs> 
This can be described as the linguistic isolation or sequestering of the colonial archives in order to make them not disappear, but unreadable. It was easy to do this, you can imagine, uh, in a, the former parts that were Italian, because once the fascist regime collapsed, uh, there was nobody going to teach anybody Italian anymore. Although Nurudin Farah himself actually, always in his novels, calls the capital of his country Mogadiscio, whereas, of course, on the atlas today, which is Italian today, you will find just simply Mogadishu. English uh, archives are not so easily put aside given the enormous global hegemony of American or Anglo-American language. So this just give you an idea of how a very gifted novelist conceives of the relationship between the state and the archive, and it's always negative. That is, the regime is the stronger, the less archives there are which is not the normal way we think about things. The second topic is a continuation of this, and it's about the isolation or sequestration of languages in the uh, third world uh, eruption of uh, nationalist movements, some uh, heavily armed, some not so, uh, and the consequences of this enormous break, that is the breakdown of uh, classical colonialism uh, from the middle 40s up until, let's say, somewhere in the, well, it goes on in the Portuguese Empire until 1970, but let's just say roughly 1960. I want to show you two cases which are in some ways similar but in other ways quite different in the, uh, the process of how and why this sequestration of colonial files uh, has come about, and what does it mean to say to be sequestered or isolated? Let me start with the Philippines. Spain ruled most of today's Philippines for somewhere between 300 and 350 years, during which time a huge accumulation of Spanish language uh, archives of different kinds were accumulated both in the colony itself and in the in, in Madrid. Unlike the situ situation of Spanish America, where the population was over time heavily Hispanicized, so there was no problem about having Spanish as the national language of a dozen or so states. But the Philippines was not like that. Uh, only at the very end of the uh, Spanish regime, which collapsed in 1998, uh, the number of people who could speak and read Spanish uh, fluently was very small, maybe not more than about 5 percent or so. The Protestant Americans who uh, first defeated the Spanish and then paid them a obnoxiously small amount of money to take over the colony, uh, there was a very interesting uh, transformation, which is the Americans, who were very Protestant in those days, um, were completely contemptuous of what they regarded as feudal Catholic Spaniards or Spanish, Catholic, Spanish Catholics, and worked very hard to create a new expanded educational system which would displace uh, Spanish and replace it by American. And by the end of the colonial period, it was estimated that something like 14% of the population could uh, speak English or American reasonably. But this was still less than two of the internal uh, domestic languages. But since many members of the first generation of upper class politicians under the Americans came from mixed backgrounds, uh, mestizos, of Spanish blood, Chinese blood, and local blood, and because there was still a kind of prestige, social prestige attached to Spanish, uh, they went on talking Spanish 
even as the files, the archives, became more and more uh, American. And there were even really attempts after World War II to revive or to do something about Spanish in the Philippines, and this was subsidized for quite a long time by none other than one of our favorite figures, which is Generalissimo Francisco Franco, uh, the dictator of Spain forever and ever. And this lasted until he died. After that, there's not much left, in, except in small elite circles. And this has meant, in effect, that the intervention of the Americans has actually made the Spanish archives pretty much illegible. There are some people, scholars, who work on them, but it's much easier for everybody to just use the American files. And complicated by the fact that in the after independence there was a decision to make Tagalog, which is spoken in those days primarily only around Manila, uh, made it more e uh, to make it a national language has made the situation more uh, difficult. It's still not really, except at the colloquial level, a national language and is unable to replace uh, that of the colonies of the empire. The irony is this, that if the Americans had uh, supported or at least didn't interfere with the First Republic of the Philippines, which lasted just less than a year in 1998, you can be almost sure that these people who ran this short republic were all Spanish speakers, would have made sure that the uh, educational system would have been based on Spanish. So in this way, the isolation of one of the really beautiful languages, Spanish, uh, would not have happened. In the case of Indonesia, we have something quite different, but very interesting. The consequences are rather similar. As you may know, for the first 200 years of Dutch meddling in the archipelago, uh, that is basically the 18th and 17th centuries, uh, power is exerted not by a royal state, as in the case of Portugal, Spain, or England, uh, but of a gigantic uh, transnational corporation called the United East Indies Corporation or Company, which was dominated by Dutchmen, but had uh, lots of different kinds of people from Northern Protestant America, plus uh, people from Africa and India and so forth and so forth. This company was a real company, like all the ones we know and don't like here, which is that they are uh, not interested typically in doing anything except making money, and this was the case with the UEIC. That is, it saw no reason to educate anybody in Dutch. It was kept as the language of reporting to the headquarters in Amsterdam, but uh, they discovered, and it was a brilliant discovery, that actually there was an existing lingua franca all across the archipelago um, what is today Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, uh, and so forth, Indonesia, which was used before the arrival of the Dutch and developed after the Dutch arrived as a lingua franca linking uh, monarchies and traders and merchants uh, traveling through these waters. And what the company did was basically say, well, that's fine, we're going to use that too. So you can find in the archives there are plenty of missives and things dealing with foreigners, or not a Dutchman, which are actually written in bad, but legible Malay. And the consequence of this in the long run is that when uh, a true colony was formed, and there's a bit of interesting history there, in 1815, uh, London, having defeated Napoleon, and eager not to have the Prussians and the French occupying the river mouths opposite England, uh, they enforced and, and put uh, a monarch on the throne, uh, which is a startling development because for 200 years the Dutch had never had a, a monarchy, they were a republic. And the colony fell into the, as the private property of the monarch or his, and his sons. And therefore it was only really in the end of the 19th century that the Dutch started to think about 
really opening school seriously and uh, because times were changing and economy, economies were changing and so forth. And this was not very successful. If you look at the numbers of people who uh, passed, uh, graduated even from high school, it's tiny compared to the 60 million population at the time. And one reason it didn't work very well was because the Dutch themselves were not confident of the prestige of their own language. They knew very well that nobody outside Holland spoke Dutch and, and nobody intended to know it. <laughs> um, this is different from the uh, arrogance of the French and the British who assumed that you know, everybody wanted to know French and used it in English too. So there was this sort of nervousness about this and that means that the kind of a, a program to Dutchify the native population never really amounted to much. And when the Japanese occupied or conquered the islands in the 1940s, Dutch was basically ready to be destroyed. It was destroyed by the Japanese, it was destroyed by the revolution that followed immediately after World War II, and by a decisions taken already in the 20s by young nationalists that the country would have a single national language which would be based on the lingua franca and had the enormous advantage of not belonging to any particular ethnic group. Dutch simply stopped being taught and uh, once the generation that was educated in uh, colonial schools was gone or was uh, retired, then there was nobody much speaking for uh, this language, although there's a huge file on the history of the country. In the 80s and 70s, 1990s, there were attempts made in Holland to give scholarships to get young Indonesian intellectuals or students to study Dutch in Holland. Spend a lot of money on it, but the signs of its success are very limited. Um, people went because they wanted to see the world, but how much they really absorbed Dutch is a very uh, small, very big question. Now, these cases are not the same, uh, but they have something in common which one can see, I think, in other parts of the uh, so called third world. That is, that Archives get isolated, get segregated, when there is a violent or fairly violent uh, overthrow of the existing regime, when the incoming uh, rulers decide they want to really see, uh, expose the, um, uh, install a new kind of archive which will take the place of the one that was there. And the easiest way to do that without a lot of uh, money and energy is to switch languages. And what you see in both the Philippines and Indonesia, that uh, each of them uh, got rid of one language, colonial language, uh, and in the case of the Philippines, they had to keep the American one. At the same time, it's interesting that in the metropoles themselves, we're thinking about London, Amsterdam, Paris, and so forth. Once colonialism is dead, it really is dead in the sense that the French people, the British people, and the Dutch people lose interest in the colonies. It's over. And therefore, in a certain kind of way, these vast archives, they're open. You can go and read what you want. But Indonesia is not really taken seriously as a part of the history of, I mean, everybody knows they were there. But for young uh, Dutch people, it's uh, increasingly irrelevant. And of course, the use of the archives in Jakarta itself is also quite limited. You can see the same kind of thing happening in the fall of Nazi Germany, when all Hitler's files uh, were made available, or most of them. And you can see it, obviously, in the Soviet Union for a short time after the end of communism, when uh, very secret archives were open for the first time for research. So any regime that is steady and doesn't have big troubles can hide its secrets better than those that are born and die in turmoil. The third topic I want to raise is something 
which I'm calling leakage. And it's a very short uh, section because I want to describe uh, something which uh, is relevant to many third world countries and perhaps one day is going to be relevant even in the, uh, the north as it were. When I'm talking about leakage, I'm not talking about Wikipedia. When I first came to Indonesia in 1962, uh, it was very clear that the country was already having rising inflation and that hyperinflation was a real possibility for the next few years. And as I stayed there until 1964, uh, I could experience the hyperinflation itself. And what I found when trying to do research for my thesis was that in the flea markets of Jakarta, one could find, and perhaps buy, very cheaply, not only a huge number of Dutch language magazines, books, and so forth, uh, from the colonial period, texts and journals in regional languages, including Chinese, uh, which were no longer in print, publications of the Japanese occupation, uh, and so forth. It was clear that this huge flow of things that some were, some were extremely precious came from the fact that the private libraries, built by middle class people mostly, uh, who were the children or the close families of these people who had libraries could no longer survive on their present income and they started to sell these pre-colonial or these colonial era uh, books and things um, because they had no use for themselves. They couldn't read them and uh, it was simply a way to um, avoid sinking into poverty. But the striking thing is that, as far as I ever discovered, I never found any bundle of private letters. That is, private letters were the things that were kept when everything else was sold. The most startling discovery was that you could find, almost everywhere in the flea markets, five kilo or ten kilo, they were heavily uh, measured, packets, bundles, of which the inside was state archives. The flea market people bought these bundles, perhaps they made the bundles themselves, because in very straightened economic circumstances, uh, the paper could be used for insulation in uh, homes, it could be used for lighting and keeping stoves, uh, going um, and also for packaging uh, this and that. And uh, nobody was expected to read these, these leaked files. They were just energy, if you like, in some form or another. And the sellers would tell you, if you asked, quite frankly, that well, you know, most of this stuff comes from uh, low and middle level civil servants whose already low salaries are being ruined by a hyperinflation which is reducing the value of their income day by day. And their only way out was to steal and sell whatever files or whatever documents that they could lay their hands on. So that the state archive was actually leaking and leaking and leaking like crazy in those years. We were also told later that you know, the ministries didn't have money to create uh, archives, to house them, to look after them, uh, to catalog them. Universities were still in their infancy and didn't have the resources of professionalism, uh, financial support, um, protection, uh, etc., etc. So there was no obvious alternative that is to put uh, archives into uh, universities or anything like that. Uh, 
When I look back on the sources of my thesis, so I never thought about this before, but just for fun I did this time, it's really quite amazing that you know, there's a lot of resources from the colonial archives, which include interrogations of Japanese prisoners of war. The Japanese basically tried to burn everything they had before they surrendered. That's one. The second is um, the, these interviews. And interviews are uh, quite fascinating. But the uh, of veterans and political leaders. But what didn't come into my bibliography was any serious state archives. Couldn't find them. Didn't know where they were. And maybe they weren't there because they'd long gone to the free market. This is one reason why, when I was sent to Indonesia, I went to Indonesia with various uh, graduate students like myself, we were given uh, warm instructions by one of Cornell's great men, Professor John Eccles from the uh, Modern Language Department in those days, who uh, spent a huge amount of his life without earning a penny to building the uh, Southeast Asia Library Collection, which is universally regarded as the best in the world. And what he did for us was to say, look, when you're going there, uh, everything is being destroyed. People are burning as they shouldn't be burning. People lose things. Please bring back anything you can and we will reimburse you. But we got into the spirit of doing this, as it were, for, for scholarship and also for Cornell. I don't remember actually asking for any money for the things that I was able to bring back to Cornell. And that's a very important uh, element in the building of the program. Okay, we've got two more to go. The uh, fourth one takes us a bit back to uh, the uh, to Nuruddin Farah, uh, because I've titled it Autocracy and Paranoia. And it's more about what happened uh, in the height of the Cold War in Southeast Asia, which was really at its height the, from the end of the 50s until the end of the 70s. And in that period, many of what were once reasonably democratic and constitutional regimes crumbled before uh, military dictatorships backed, I'm sorry to say, by the US of A. Uh, and, of course, the successful uh, communist autocracies in Indochina. Now, as you can imagine, under autocratic regimes, everybody has to be very careful. And um, the paranoia that occurs in Nuruddin's novel is not fictitious. Uh, people were very scared uh, about what files they kept and where they kept them, and especially after the massacres of communists on a colossal scale, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, even more people were scared as to what might be uh, found by the regime. Very important. But I think actually beneath this kind of simple kind of fear, especially among people who you would expect to keep uh, a lot of documents because they're higher politicians, bureaucrats, uh, intellectuals, and so forth. Uh, what you find is, in fact, the deepest possible suspicion of any national archive, in fact, almost any, any archive, except perhaps sometimes safely in an American institution. Handed over to the state, the idea was this. It was handed over to the state, private letters, memoranda, diaries would, if not lost, if not destroyed, deliberately or accidentally, quietly sold off to flea markets, could be used to damage their political and moral reputations. That is, the fear that the really personal documents uh, could ruin them politically and perhaps even legally 
So typically, these documents, where they survive, are kept inside the family. But as you can imagine, over time, from parents to children to grandchildren, interest in the family file uh, and capacity to safeguard it as time passes means that there is a kind of, uh, from what I know, of the documents. They're put in an attic somewhere, people forget where they are, bad rains come, um, we forgot to uh, make, uh, get rid of all the water, rats are running loose and so forth. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that the grandchildren typically are not interested in the, uh, as it were, the secret file of grandpa. Um, they don't read it, but as a family property and as the kind of totem for the distinction of the lineage, hey, grandfather, he used to be the governor of what, 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 and so forth, um, that's enough for social climbing. Uh, it's not necessary to read the documents themselves as long as they're there. That's pretty much most. In my experience, and it's a very interesting thing, you could interview people quite easily in Indonesia and late, later in other countries that I worked in. Quite, very easy to get interviews. Um, but the best interviews were always the ones where the review, I mean the, the interviewee didn't want to be recorded on tape. Um, why not? Where is it going to go? Well, he doesn't know where it's going to go, but you can never tell. But at the same time, this generosity in terms of stories, uh, anecdotes, memories and all kinds, uh, I find it almost impossible to see or read any of these secret family archives. I don't think I've ever seen one. Oral memory, which is uh, plenty of, is wonderful and often funny and to the point, but it is profoundly unreliable. The older people get, as I know to my cost, the less you really remember. And you remember what you want to remember, and that's all. But distrust of universities and their libraries also is a function of their politicization. Um, as social conflicts, political conflicts became worse. And as far as the universities were politicized, state and eventually also private ones, it was very difficult for libraries to get going on this. They didn't have the uh, financial resources, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the professional capacities to collect, safeguard and organize the documents to say nothing about a reliability of a promised time uh, concerns. That is, you could say, well, please don't open this file until 30 years. You couldn't be sure that within nine years it would somehow appear or would somehow have been opened. So distrust is very important to the history of the archive or archives in places like Indonesia. Actually, there were very a few very extraordinary exceptions, and the one I just want to mention briefly is this. The very long-lived literary critic, H.B. Yasin, who knew almost every Indonesian writer of his generation and, more important, corresponded constantly with them, created a unique uh, archive of almost all the important and even not very important uh, writers and poets of that time. And these were kept by him as open to the public. And it had nothing to do with family, it had to do with an idea of duty to the country. And as long as he was alive, it was carefully um, looked after, catalog uh, catalogued and so forth. But after his death, as you might expect, uh, money became scarcer, uh, the Indonesian state, which is run basically barbarians or philistines never read anything except uh, newspapers or probably porno magazines i don't know but in any case um, the they're not destroyed this kind of 
institute is not destroyed, but it's not going to be helped very much, and so it's basically stagnant since the old man died. Now one outcome of this uh, imbalance between, uh, or this situation, is a fascinating imbalance between biographies and autobiographies. And those of you who are studying other parts of, South East, of, of the Third World will be interesting to know what you think about this. But my impression is that serious biographies of important people, intellectuals, military men, so politicians and so forth, in the region are actually quite rare. And most of the ones that we know of, that I know of, were done by foreigners and who don't run any real risks, at least normally don't run any uh, great risks. Whereas writing biographies in your own country of people who are still alive or just uh, passed away, there's very uh, incalculable repercussions might come from it. And even uh, foreigners sometimes get badly punished. And, uh, the famous example of recent years is a book called The King Who Never Smiles, written by an American reporter, Paul Handley, who studied and gathered information over years to write this biography, which is not, you know, it's critical, but it's not damning in any way. And the first reaction of the state in the form of the king was to try to get Yale University Press to ban, or to, to stop, uh, not to publish the book, and to burn whatever there existed of in, in their offices. Well, for once Yale had some spine and said no. Uh, immediately, uh, the book was banned in Thailand, of course, uh, secret uh, copies circulate around, and Handley himself was, as it were, permanently exiled from a country he was very fond of. Obviously, lo local scholars run still more risks, but there are a few, and these are interesting cases, where the grandchildren or children of a very top political figure who somehow, after his death, was, de was uh, despised and uh, written down and so forth, they have the, the enough in the family files to publish books defending their grandfathers. And these rare but very thick volumes actually are full of stuff that otherwise no one would ever see. So it isn't as if the grandchildren were all, you know, lousy. Some of them are quite uh, dedicated, even though these books are, of course, naturally, uh, dad, granddad was perfect, is the main theme. There's one extraordinary case uh, to the lack of serious biographies, and this is so interesting that it will tell you something about uh, how archives changed under different regimes at different times, and that is this that there are dozens and dozens of books about the uh, great Filipino hero, Jose Rizal. Um, it's amazing how many there are. But the reason why there are so many is because in the American period, for reasons that I'll mention, lots of people got together to collect all his correspondence, and it wasn't very long after he'd been executed by the Japanese, and when things was quite fresh. And uh, volume after volume after volume, I think there are 20 in all of his letters, uh, properly, uh, what I want, catalogued, uh, put in chronological order, divided by subject matter, and so forth. This guy never stopped writing. Um, and these are an extraordinary, impressive record of the personal and intellectual life of one of the great men of Southeast Asia. There's nothing like that for any other person in modern Southeast Asian history, and it's fantastic. I mean, you could go on writing books about him on the basis of these really amazing, uh, sometimes funny, sometimes very desperate letters that he wrote to his family, to his friends, against his enemies, uh, foreign scholars who are interested in him, and so forth and so forth. It's a very cosmopolitan in many ways, which is very unlike the files of most um, Southeast Asian people of that period. <laughs>
The question is why did this uh, this, cat this vast collection of letters came into existence? Was the good luck that the Americans had no invested interest in Rizal. He had been killed by the lousy Spanish. So that there was no uh, attempt by the Americans to, uh, as it were, isolate him. In fact, they helped to popularize a kind of cult of Rizal. And I think that some of the money, quite a lot of the money, for the publication of these uh, letters came from the colonial government. The irony of this is that if Rizal had not been executed at 35 and had lived to be 80, that is well into the Japanese occupation, we have no idea what would have happened to those uh, documents in dark times. The American year was the right time because everything was more or less orderly and people felt an obligation to the national hero. So these letters that he wrote uh, with the cooperation of his family uh, created this absolutely exceptional archive. It's the most open archive I can imagine and very rare. Okay, we're getting... Now, contrastively, autobiographies are very common and you find them given mainly by retired generals and retired politicians, some retired uh, intellectuals, not many. Typically, they are vanity publications, usually without any footnotes, or if the footnotes are there, they're probably wrong, uh, contain a lot of lies, lots of omissions, uh, ugly prose, uh, and so on. And nonetheless, they're always very readable. Because you want to see, ah, it's like, you know, gotcha. And you read this thing, oh my God, look what he said, you know, this, that, and the other. So it actually it's quite fun. Um, but curiously enough, these, in contrast to these vanity autobiographies, you know, everybody who's anybody wants to have, even if it's ghost written by something else, they love to have the idea that my life is there for everybody to admire. There are some remarkable documents from the colonial period uh, in the form of truncated autobiographies which are absolutely opposite to this. And these are really not very well known on the whole. I will only pick one, which is in some ways for me the most remarkable uh, uh, document, which has never been published in a complete form. It's a story about a truly horrendous childhood and adolescence of a young boy in East Java in the late teens, 20s. It was written when he was about 28 years old, and it's about his life, really, until he was about 22. It's written in rather clunky, sometimes, Malay, but it's absolutely intelligible. And what's interesting about it is that it's an account primarily on what happened to him when his uh, parents uh, broke up, the father went to jail, uh, the mother was forced to marry a, a brute, a Madurese brute, who constantly beat, it, beat him, the little boy, stopped him from going to school, and finally at the age of 15 he ran away, all alone with no money, and started roaming the East Java province, uh, barely surviving. And, but it's an absolutely fascinating account of absolute poverty, <coughs> absolute abjection, and so forth. And it's told with amazing honesty and grief, bitterness, but very sharp social critic. The thing that really makes it really extraordinary, however, is the fact that in the first part of this document, which is quite long, uh, there is a whole section devoted to this, th this boy when he was 13 years old, I had a love affair with a senior boy who was two years older than him. And the story of that uh, it lasted a year because then the parents took the children away in different directions. The, the crucial thing is the unbelievable uh, frankness. It's not pornographic at all, but he tells you what lovers do. And you know, there's never been a single book written in Indonesia since then which talks about 
two young men, one directly, just boys, really deeply in love with each other. And it's very touching and also at the same time it's very funny. And this, how this got into the colonial archive is not very clear. It probably came from a Dutch civil servant who got to know this guy and parked a copy, a copy there. In the 1970s, a uh, well-meaning uh, Dutch, uh, not Dutch, Chinese doctor decided this is important and he published a version of it in which almost everything except the sex was left out. And, and not surprisingly, it was immediately banned by the regime. Um, and it's pretty because actually the whole thing is all about social conditions, about uh, social stratification, about why people are so miserable and so forth. It's really a very fascinating book. And you can be sure that this kind of document would never enter the Republic of Indonesia's archives and be thrown out or burned or whatever. So the colonial archives still have things in them which need to be looked at. Okay, I'm going to end now, which is, uh, the topic is the twilight of letters. This is a little bit personal, I hope you don't mind if it's uh, annoying to you. My mother died in 1990, and I realized at that point I was no longer getting any letters, not just from home. She had faithfully written to me every 10 days or so since I left for America in 1958. And I replied, not quite as diligently, uh, but there it was. I took these letters completely for granted and always answered uh, fairly promptly, and both of us spent money on stamps and sending. And we didn't wait particularly. The letter would come in when it would come in, and it was nice when it came, but there was no anxiety about the correspondence at all. Walter Ben Nguyen famously says that one feels the beauty of things at the moment that they're vanishing. And I remember after she died, I looked at all her letters which I'd kept quite faithfully for no particular purpose, uh, and I found something absolutely astounding that in all those letters she wrote those years, there wasn't, she wrote in ink on paper, and in all those letters, there wasn't a single deletion, a single crossing. She wrote, she thought about what she was going to write, and she wrote it. And I discovered later that in my, grand, my grandfather's letters and my father's letters too, that these people are absolutely astounding. I mean, they wrote you know, reports, they wrote diaries and so forth. No crossing out, no white paint, no delete. Is really astonishing. I mean, you can see how a, a kind of uh, a reflective culture, uh, which is still very dear to me still to this day. I used often to, to send letters to her that were not handwritten, but were on a ratty old typewriter. And it still had a certain kind of life because you can see the typical typographical mistakes I made and was too lazy or. Uh, to, to change. Um, it's full of blotches and so forth, but it's my blotches, not somebody else's blotches. And the reason for this, obviously, which we all know, is that enormous pressures to speed everything up, and in fact the early computers were regarded basically as high-speed um, electro electric typewriters and were used. It was not until the arrival of the internet or worldwide uh, whatever it is, came in, <laughs> into existence. Um, I should say also that, you know, when I look at those letters, you know, I can see still the traces. You know, she kept some of my letters, not all. You can see the blotch of the uh, tuna salad sandwich. It somehow <laughs> got there. And you could also see my mother had a way that she could tilt her sentences slightly upwards across the page if she was feeling good and slightly down on the other side. And even if what she said was cheerful, if I saw the sentence going down, I knew she wasn't happy. So there were all these very private and close and intimate things, which I think is very, uh, I still miss a lot. And the crucial thing is we didn't write 
uh, with attachments, and we didn't write with forward, please. And, uh, letters were supposed to be private, and if you wanted to send it to somebody else, you had to ask permission, and that's, I think, disappeared. The whole idea of sending any letter simultaneously to a couple of hundred people was absolutely unthinkable in that time. I knew that if I destroyed the letters, they would be gone forever. That was it. And I was the last guardian, if you can put it. Now, in the, when the, the computers began, and we're getting near the end, I hope, um, what one finds is that people used them, I think, to correct uh, spelling, to get rid of indiscretions, edit all kinds of written documents, and, uh, which they were able to do much more efficiently than the electronic, uh, electric typewriters. Still, even at that stage, one printed final drafts and one still paid for stamps and still sent the letter as first-hand documents. But then came very fast the era of the internet, and I remember when I first, uh, as it were, got smacked in the head by it. And, uh, it's a, a ridiculous story about my, my ridiculousness, so I don't mind telling it to you. I gave a talk at the University of Indiana uh, about that time, and in the course of it, or at the end of it, I made some snarky and badly informed comments on the, uh, what this internet was all about and so on and forth. And in, at the end, there was a woman in the audience, quite a large audience, who was enraged and got up and said, you know, how could you talk like this? It's such a disgusting way that you've been discussing this. Let me tell you that the best sex I've ever had in my life, I had on the internet. <laughs> She went on to say that her partner was in South African and that she didn't need to meet him. But she hadn't. I was completely stunned. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, she meets him in the cybersphere. Mm. I couldn't think what to say. Mm. What really astonished me was that the youngsters in the audience, undergraduates and so forth, graduate students, enthusiastically applauded her. And without irony, without being mean, it was clear the intention was, go, go, go. And I was, I was very supportive. And I was just really amazed because all I could think of at the time, I didn't know what to say at all. And suddenly it occurred to me, I started to think about what happens to cheap red wine in Catholic churches uh, at Mass. That is, they become transfigured. And I was starting to think, well, does the internet actually make it possible to be transfigurative in other circumstances. Let me conclude with uh, what I consider the interesting contrasts between the letter and the email message, or if you like, communication. Because not often people do this, and it's quite interesting. If one opens one's laptop, one notes at least five characteristics of that machine compared to uh, the former, that is, the letters. The first is easy and simple. It must be surely the sheer volume of messages, which in my personal experience is at least 10 times, and maybe 15 times what it was per day uh, compared to the early 90s when I was still, or 80s when I was still writing letters. At the same time, these messages which pour in all the time are, even if not obviously or straightforwardly so, they are very uh, hectoring. That is the idea, I've just sent you a very fast mail, I want a, as fast as possible, you send one back to me, and then I want to know why you haven't uh, written or emailed me in the last 24 hours and so forth. So this very uh, uh, pr uh, pressure is great. And something that you know, was intended originally to save time, here we've got these great communications, we can meet anybody in the world, actually take up much more time than letters used to. I reckon it's you know, probably on average up to two hours a day is spent doing this stuff. 
The second thing that's very striking are the, are the command signs on computers. And they really are commands. And, and behind those commands, there is the real one, which I will reveal to you in a minute. These commands are delete, empty trash, forward, attach, print, save. And behind all these, a central sign is for God's sake, decide and fast. There is no sign saying reflect. <laughs> or one for delay. The third, obviously, uh, difference. I mean, you don't in the least feel intimidated by uh, the basic typewriter or one's pen and ink or biro or ballpoint pen, but you can be intimidated by this set of uh, military-like orders. The third is obviously deep changes in writing style, which come much closer to telephone calls than does the outmoded letter. The need for speed and save time means that message, typical messages are actually very short, and colloquial, clumsy, coy, ungrammatical, plenty of typos, but who cares anyway, and using a very limited vocabulary. The transformation is especially visible. I mean, this is where a new kind of language is emerging, a written language, which is, uh, is not really, it's halfway between a written language and a phone call, and it can be very funny in the hands of the right person, but a lot of it is very annoying and tedious. That this transformation has shifted into other spheres comes with, I don't know if any of you here uh, do the New York Times code pros crossword puzzle uh, and compare the crossword puzzles today with what they were like 15 years ago. And the striking thing is this, that in the old days, 15 years ago, the crossword puzzle was still intended to educate readers, expand their vocabulary, check their spelling and so forth. And basically, the source is you go to the standard dictionaries. This has disappeared. And now, I calculate on the basis of a lot of uh, these uh, crossword puzzles, is that about 30% of every crossword puzzle doesn't actually have words. It has suffixes, it has affixes, it has abbreviations, it has acronyms, it has the names of minor TV personalities, uh, long gone American football or um, basketball heroes. Uh, once in a while you might get um, a foreigner mentioned, but never a Canadian and never a Mexican. Um, and in fact, the easiest way to solve the puzzle, the machine will do it for you. That is, you plug into to Google. And it's all there, even down to logo names, which the, the crossword puzzle loves, the logo names of various corporations. I mean, who wants to remember that? But Google does it for you, and so you can uh, check it. The fourth, I think, is the obvious one, which is the technique of almost instant reduplication of any number of receivers. And finally, the one I think probably is the most important, is the question of longevity. Our libraries have, in their rare book sections, uh, letters which have survived half a millennium. But the lifespan of messages or communications is likely to be very short. Printouts decay rapidly. Incessant technological change makes the codes for deciphering old disks from, say, 10 years ago, or other forms of storage uh, make these uh, frequently accessible, except for those who have the money and the giant machines which allow for this stuff to be uh, saved. When I kept thinking about this, I thought the saddest part of the computer's commands is save, since actually what it really means is reprieve. <laughs> Last word. <laughs>
A few days ago, I read an interesting article by a well-known historian on the sway of Google, this giant American corporation which covers the world, and the reach of digitalization. The author pointed out that the digitalization of an archive can, in fact, only be done when the site of the documents is known and its contents are already catalogued. That is, he concluded that the most secret documents in the world are preserved private letters in places that no one expects and no one knows, and often in languages, hypothetically languages which very few people understand. Under these conditions, the research engine has to give way to the slow, dogged, tactful, maybe detective work by diligent single scholars, I don't mean unmarried, I mean individual scholars, who will very often have to be polyglot, they have to know plenty of languages. Finding and accessing unknown files is one of the greatest pleasures available to scholars, not least because they never come free of charge. And one might even go far, so far as to say that these unknown collections, none of us knows where they are, are more secret than the most secret of state files, to say nothing of the Vatican. Thank you. for a sort of question period or what? Hmm? Yeah, I don't know whether, but I hope some people are sufficiently enraged uh, <laughs> that I can be stunned like I was in Indiana. Um, Yeah, I, I deliberately didn't talk about the uh, suppression of archives and their hiding because it's too well known. Um, but it's also, you know, vulnerable. Somebody, somebody's going to break the lock or something's going to happen to it. Um, I mean, I think the leakage is what we're going to be looking for. I mean, don't be too worried about the Wikipedia, but I think it's going to be harder and harder for these uh, locked files to stay locked. And, no, there's no doubt one of the reasons why. I mean, if you looked at the, the Siad Bari regime, I'm sure he was storing documents. But the point is that he told people that there were none at all. Nothing could be traced. It's a brilliant image. And, but, uh, you know, almost every year you can find some great scandal breaking out in Britain or Paris or Germany or America or whatever it is and it has origins in the breaking into files that were supposed to be closed. And sometimes they're just kept because they are so rare. I mean, there are plenty of uh, things in the rare book collection which you're not allowed to take out, you're not allowed to bring up all point or uh, anything in them. I mean, it's very careful to make sure that um, the space for doing something that you want to do is nil, and what you have to do is what the rare book room allows you to do, and that's a kind of you know, mild form of, of, of this kind of suppression. You know, people want to actually touch the thing, not read a goddamn copy of it, and it's this kind of aura around 
letters which is still, I hope, still alive. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a highly political institution, so that, you know, there's enormous uh, parts of that file which are absolutely closed, um, except for insiders, maybe. And the answer to that is, um, but it's the way all the other archives were opened eventually, which is for the very regime. I mean, the minute the monarchy falls, which is a possibility, then the files will be opened or made more open. There's no way that the royal family as it stands now, with its power and its money, is going to tolerate um, poking into um, any archives which they think might be damaging for them. So we want uh, a bit of a, maybe a mini revolution would be a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, the reason why it's so powerful is because it's never been blocked. That is, uh, Thailand has been subjugated sort of from a distance by Britain and then later America, but the regime has stayed the same, and so there's no break in the system uh, which would encourage this. In all the other cases that I mentioned, it all depends on a, a real crisis, either economic or political, which changes the whole condition under which files archives survive. Yes. Mm. So um, I'm struck by what the response from the data librarians would be. Which would be now that we have electronic storage capacity, assuming we get the conversion software, we can we can store everything. We can search it. We can digitize everything. What that does is it changes point of the text from being a description of a totality of an experience to being a source of a snapshot that you can use for data. So the more, the most I ever learned about politics in Southeast Asia was when I read an entire newspaper every day for seven months. When I look at that as a corpus of data that I can search and count the number of times per day that China is mentioned in Utsasan, Malaysia, I, I, I get nothing but the most superficial understanding of what uh, newspaper is actually trying to tell me. So would you tell the data librarians to continue their wonderful digitization projects? Or would you tell them to encourage people to slow down, read, try to focus on not on how much you can do, but on small, focused, but more, perhaps, total descriptions of the world that you can Well, yes. I mean, I have nothing against digitalization itself. Um, what I think is, um, I was going to say Looney Tunes, um, but actually it reminds me of some of the most brilliant stories by Borges. Um, these fantastic stories about madmen who want to create this, that, and the other. I mean, the idea that Google is going to have all the information in the world from the time, it's not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen, because uh, no one country should have this kind of power. And fortunately, I think that um, some of the larger foreign companies, uh, states, are saying, uh, we don't, maybe we don't need you. Uh, get out of here. <laughs> 
but I mean, it's an enormously, it's like the sort of, I'm going to build the Tower of Babel, you know, and well, you know what happened with that. And I don't believe that, you know, the, uh, there's a huge problem in translation because all these automatized translations are just laughable. Um, and you just, I'm not reading anything that has any depth to it in the original documents. And that's a rather distressing thing that more and more you see books written in America, scholarly books in which, uh, if you look at the bibliography, all the publishing, all the books that it rely on is the US or the internet. Um, that shouldn't be right. And the attempt basically to uh, build Anglo-American into a kind of permanent uh, pl planetary uh, emperor language. I think it's also, it's really, uh, it produces a lot of junk. My people is not their first language, but they feel under pressure to do this. And it also means that uh, people here uh, feel less and less any need to learn any other languages. I mean, ours is the universal language. That's in the back of Google's mind too. But this is naturally, of course, I'm very prejudiced. But there's something really okay about it. I mean, they're making millions and millions and billions of dollars uh, out of this. In some ways, it's worse than state archives, you know, because it's got higher ambitions. Yes? Um, yes, uh, what secret archives would you like to look at if you could look at any secret archives in the world? Where do you focus on Southeast Asia? Well, it depends what the motivation is. If you want scandal, <laughs> uh, and scandals that really, I mean, financial scandals are so common that nobody can get excited about them. But obviously, uh, sex gossip is uh, something which is, regimes try to mask as much as possible. So in a sense, if you wanted to make trouble for the regime, that's what you'd look for. But I think if there are no, these are not really files, they're just items. But the, the files, obviously everybody wants to see what the uh, intelligence service has been writing to itself and other people over a given period of time. This is the, probably the most secret of these state documents. But it's also tiresome um, because somebody made this wonderful note that the relationship between military intelligence and intelligence is the same difference between Mozart and a parade band. I mean, they're not in the same sphere at all. I don't know why I should maybe to persuade them not to use intelligence anymore. I mean, they should use intelligence, but not call themselves intelligence. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose a lot of them, actually, I mean, because they collected data as much as they could on all the people they hated, so it's quite interesting to see what these files and who their informants were in uh, destroying reputations, which they all, in different ways, tried to do. I mean, everybody has their own choice which they want to dig up. But actually, I'm not that interested, but I would love to find an unknown file. And, um, you know, it's that excitement of being the pairing. I know nobody's ever seen this, well, they have, of course, but, and um, what can I do with it? What can I learn from it? And so forth. I mean, this is the real pleasure, rather than endlessly batting away at databases and so forth, at least for my temperament. Yes? Well, I think in that, I think everybody does that. That is, you write to communicate, not to confess. That is, you know that your auntie is worried about you and you respond to what she wants to know. And you talk to your colleagues. You don't talk about 
the quarrel you had with your mother or anything like that. I mean, every letter that you send is based on the idea that it will be replied to, and therefore you have to have create a, a communication on what concerns them. If you want to write a my true life somewhere, and then you can publish it as a book, how scandalous I was, and so forth. But in, in the in come and go of um, these kinds of family letters or personal letters, very often you find it's not so much that you're lying, that you can actually do lying very well too. Uh, most of it is silence. That is, you don't talk about it, you admit it. Even though you think that the person on the other end actually probably has a pretty good idea what you're staying silent about. But there's a kind of decorum, a kind of idea about well, metal in other people's affairs too much. It's a very good question, but I think that uh, if you look at your own practice, I mean, when you get onto the internet and look at what you say to different people, um, it's actually very interesting. But I certainly don't write the same letters to everybody, except in these terrible forward, mass forwards, which are absolutely empty. Mm. I've never seen a circular letter like that, which you didn't want to throw away right away. I mean, it's no fun doing the crossword if you just go to the computer and, and you'll find all the answers to you. What's the point, you know? It's a very smart uh, uh, question. I mean, it's partly Benjamin's you know, part of him that I like, which is you know, a kind of you know, romanticism. Um, but I think that the situation of the storyteller, uh, which is eclipsed, he has this long passage where he says that uh, the storyteller doesn't exist anymore. Because what the storyteller did was to tell you uh, ways to live, and the stories that they tell have a kind of power that even after hundreds of years is still there. And he goes on to say, well, you know, today everything is information, and the crucial thing about information, which is everywhere, is that it's a, um, it doesn't matter, it's a, uh, what he says, it's, it's explanation. Everything has to be explained in information. Once it's been explained, then it has no longer any value. And it's obviously, he's thinking a bit about the relationship between um, state documents, for example, and poetry or novels or whatever it is. I mean, I think that uh, I can yell. I mean, I think that my, I've sort of posed the unknown letters in the place of the storyteller. It may not be worth it, but it has an aura because nobody knows where it is. And you can go on searching it and never find one at all. But it's, uh, it's it can be a kind of passion things are retrieved which never thought that they would actually have achieved. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, also a romanticized version. I mean, I've been as nasty as I can about uh, some things and sympathetic to others. Mm -hmm. 
but in a time when you know everybody's very busy with uh, internet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it seemed to me it might be useful just to remind ourselves of why things lasted so long. I was looking at something the other day, and it was an astounding collection of letters sent by small merchants in some Italian town in the 14th century. They're writing notes to each other. The price has gone up. And the fact that this should survive over, what is it, 600 years, I just can't imagine you know, what's going to survive from our time. And how would you know, anyway? Okay. Sorry about the mic. Is it working now? <laughs> I already yelled. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you.